Well, Paul, I finally took the plunge and started doing stuff with Blender this week. <gasps> oh, I'm so excited. Tell me more. I'm not even sure what brought it on. I was just sort of fiddling around. I'm, I've been like, every few weeks I go to model something. You know, I need some little giga or a doodad for some thing I'm doing in Unity, right? And it's mm. usually something simple. But every time I open up Blender, it's um, it's an ordeal. I've forgotten everything. I can't remember the hotkeys. How do you move the kit? No, that's not moving the kit. Oh, I moved the freaking 3D cursor again. Ugh. And now everything that I spawn, all the new objects I create will be off the grid. <laughs> it's ah. stupid. And just like... Oh, making the same, not only making dumb mistakes, but making the same dumb mistakes every time. And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to try and build something. Uh, recently, I watched, I mean, it's an old video, a video from Captain Disillusion. I don't know if you've ever watched his YouTube channel. Oh, yeah, he's, he's quite a big deal. And there's a video where he debunks. I mean, this didn't even need to be debunked. It's like a pachinko machine where colored balls drop down through the machine and it ran it randomly you know there in a pachinko machine there's all these pegs on the way down I mean it, it's really just pure chaos a ball can mm. go to the left of the peg or the right of the peg and Whichever way it goes, it's going to hit another peg and go either left or right, and then hit another peg and go either left or right. So you get this distribution at the bottom of all the balls falling into the different slots, right? Yeah. You, you're you familiar with this idea. and But in this machine, all the red ones landed in the far left slot, and then, you know, like green, all the same color. The, in each slot, all the balls were the same color. Mm. Um, and that was pretty amazing to me. I mean, for one thing, it was done in a photoreal style, so it was pretending to be a real thing. But I mean, he, you know, debunked that like, oh, look, there's no latch and there's no, like, there's no way you could open this to put the balls in. And like, how does this thing work <laughs> as a physical oh, okay. object? Someone did like a, a special effect thing and made it look kind of like a real pachinko machine, but it was all CG. It was entirely CG, but that part isn't that interesting. Uh, it was like an object that's made to look photoreal that isn't. Mm -hmm. it, it was a CG object that they um, placed into a real photographed environment, which is why it kind of looked um, believable. Sure. Motion track but, it or something, or was it a stationary shot? I don't remember, but... The thing that captivated me was, well, well, wait, the ball sorting. That actually is a bit of a puzzle. I mean, if you're going to, unless you're going to hand animate, they, these were like tiny little beads. And so there were just a thousand of them or something. And I'm like, did he hand animate all the beads? No. Blender bakes the simulation. So you change a parameter and then it like calculates it. So it'll be the same every time. So you run it to the end and then you paint the balls once they land in their slots. Mm, yeah. So it's not, it doesn't violate chaos theory. It's just predestination. Right. You already know where they're going to land. So then you change their color and then back at the beginning, they all look all mixed up and they magically sort themselves out. But it's because... You knew which ones were going to end up where, and so you covered them that way. Right. And I loved that. I've always loved that. I thought that was genuinely clever. I mean, I'm sure a million other people have done that. But I decided to build that. And so I built it. I actually started a second YouTube channel just for, like, when I want to post weird crap. Oh, I, I found that now that I'm doing visit video essays on YouTube... I found people very hostile to me just posting random crap. Oh, here I made a song. Here I made this thing. Or I did a joke video. And people were like, oh, this channel's going downhill. And I'm like, well, this... I mean, I just wanted somewhere to upload something so I could share it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. 
so I made a second cha channel for that sort of thing. And this is the first thing on that channel is I built several objects and each of them was like an exercise. The first was an exercise in modeling and the next two was an exercise in making materials. And uh, I will have that Very embedded cool. video. Yeah, I will have that video in the show notes for those who care to look. I mean, it's 58 seconds long and it's in super um, low res. It's like 480p or something. Yeah, I did the final render. I'm like, okay, this is my first Blender render. I don't want to spend 12 hours. My computer sitting there churning out this worthless <laughs> animation. Like, let's just turn all the settings down and bang it out in 20 minutes there you go you could probably do it in eevee and then it would be like real time right i realized that just before i came in here to talk to you is i discovered <laughs> if you oh if i turn on eevee then it can do the whole render super fast but i can see the whole thing and see that it's one of the problems i had to do these renders several times because i'd get everything all set up paint all the balls and then I'd make what I thought was an innocuous change. Oh, oh, I need to move this object a little to the left. Had nothing to do with the interaction of the balls and the pachinko machine. But just the fact that I changed something caused um, Blender to just rebake a brand new animation. So I'd wait, you know, I'd sit there, I'd you know, have it render out the entire animation that I get done. And it's just the balls are all scrambled and it completely defeats the purpose of it. <laughs> I did that to myself so many times. I felt like an idiot. Oh no. Did you actually bake the dynamics or, or are you just letting it automatically calculate every time? Uh, I just let Blender do whatever. Because there is a button that says bake and it'll, it'll solidify oh. it. So no matter what you change, it'll never recalculate the physics. Oh, yeah, there is a button. That, that's been my problem. There's a button for everything. Yeah, yeah. The problem isn't that the button is hard to... Well, I mean, the button is hard to find, but that's not a problem with Blender. The, you know, the problem is it just has so much it does. It is so powerful. Those buttons have to be put somewhere, and you need a way to find them. But to find them, you have to know what they're called. Um. Yeah. One of the things I was doing, I was building gears. I have no idea why. I just decided that would be a good exercise to give myself is to build gears. I don't mm. even need gears. I just like, want, you know, I wanted to um, build, a, build a complex, more complex than a pachinko machine. This pachinko machine is pretty friggin' simple, right? And yeah. so I was like, okay, I want to make something more complicated. And I decided to make gears. And I'm like, what is wrong with this gear? It looks wrong. And I realized, you know, and then I Google reference photo. Always, I should have started with reference photos. Always start with mm -hmm. one. As soon yep. as you open, as soon as you open up the reference photo, the light comes on. Of course, gears always have bits cut out of the center to use less material and to make them lighter. So that's easy enough. You can just cut out bits of the center, but then you've got this gap between the two sides that you need to bridge. And you can do that manually. It's like, okay, nudge the camera into place, select these four vertices and create a face between them. And then move the camera slightly, select four more vertices, create a bridge between them. Move the camera slightly. And I'm, you know, this takes you know, 20 minutes to fill in this gear after this trivia. And I'm like, I know there's a tool for this. I know there's a tool. I know there's a tool, but I have no idea what it's called. You know what it is? The the add gear tool or bridge edge loops or what are you yeah, trying to do? That's exactly it. Yep. Yeah. I needed, I needed two things. I needed select edge loops and then I needed bridge mm. edge loops. And so oh, after yeah. doing this, for like several gears and every time it took 20 minutes and it was just the most tedious non creative work ever i finally found the right combination of search terms typed them in and found exactly what i wanted and then all future ones 
went it went from being 20 minutes to like 10 seconds <laughs> it was just like oh wow when you it's amazing how yeah how powerful it is but it's it's i mean that's why i'm doing it is to get over that initial hump of like what is the thing that i need to do called and how do i and search for another it? another way to do it is if you have two edge loops that have the same number of vertices in them i don't know if you were matching same to same but if you've got the I same was. edge loops that have the same number of vertices yeah then you can you can bridge one face you know it's like the two edges fill and then select that edge and just keep hitting the f key and it'll keep filling in faces as it goes around because it'll just create quads all the way around and that's also really handy for you know, filling stuff in if you don't want it uh, the whole edge loop right and as far as gears if you go to add-ons add extra objects the add mesh extra objects add-on then there's a gears builder that'll just build you gears you know set the number of teeth and all that that's cool although um i mean it was for, for the exercise the point, you were doing it for yeah. right right it's like yeah so i was i was jogging oh you know you can get a car <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I started using a car, got my morning jog down to about a minute and a half. That's right. Got on my bike, started my morning walk. It, it was it was an interesting exercise. Now I'm trying to... The, the weird thing is, I just wanted this knowledge. But once you start using it, then you look for a way to justify the time you've put it. Like, why do I feel the need to justify it? The knowledge is what I was after. But now I'm like... Well, I should make a video with this so that it wasn't a waste of time. Ah, uh, yeah. So once again, um, I've hogged too much of the show with my little adventure. I apologize. No, no, that's that's very fun. I'm glad you've been doing Blender stuff. I just wanted to add one more yeah. thing about the um, the thing with the pachinko balls. There's sure. a, another technique that does a similar kind of thing where you run a physics simulation and you know you have a bunch of things falling all over the place and they end up in a big heap. And then you put the camera somewhere and you, you do a UV projection texture on all those objects and put a, oh, an image on those. Right. And then so it looks you like run the simulation the and they all fall yeah. into place exactly so that it you know, makes the image. So that could be fun too. So you just project a dick butt onto a pile of boxes and then everybody's <laughs> like, right. what's it going to be at the end? Oh, it's, um, yeah, it, I just, it is really impressive how powerful blender is just all the tools everything that you could want to do it's like if you are spending your time being not creative if there's something that's drudge work there's probably you're probably doing it wrong and there's probably a tool that will do it for you and the the trick is you need to know what it's called to find it yeah my sister was working on on a a tutorial a little while ago and she was trying to figure out why her objects were all acting weird and she didn't know like the object center was all offset so she had she'd accidentally moved right. the 3d cursor like you did and then she was doing all this modeling in the middle of the scene but all the centers of her objects were all way off in nowhere land and uh right. but she didn't know like what is this little circle and like i don't even know what it's called and so i made a video called like weird object rotation thing what is this circle i don't know what i'm doing in blender you know movie and it's like okay here this is what it's called this is how you find it this is how you manipulate it here's like three different ways of manipulating it because like when you're lost there you don't know what it is you don't know you just know that's not doing what you want right <clears throat> yeah a plot moving an object's origin inside of its volume and applying mm. scales and rotations are just I would fell for that multiple times. I'm like, oh, I need to, why is this bevel not working? I'm trying to bevel some edge oh, yeah. and it's coming out all wonky. And I'm like, what could be causing this? And looking through all these settings and it, I realized, you know, I've, I, two hours ago, I scaled the object and I never hit apply. And so Blender has been just dutifully re remembering that, okay, you think it's 10 meters long, but really it's just one. You're just stretching it. <laughs> yeah, I'm stretching it out for you, just like you asked. Right. Oh, oh I fell for that because it, it, it makes all the tools wonky. When you have like a scaled and partly rotated object, it's just always wonky. Mm. And you just need to remember to apply that when you're done. 
or you'll come back to it later and it won't do what you think you want to do. Yeah. Although you can get some nice effects if you do it on purpose, like for text, um, for doing like cursive kind of stuff, you can rotate something and then like scale it weird and then do a solidify and then like unscale it. And then it'll, it'll have the solidify will be thicker in some places and thinner in other places, depending on the angle of the line. Oh, so, I mean, you can, you can use it, but if you're not aware of it, yeah, it'll throw you off. So what have you been working on? I have also been making things in Blender. I, I learned a little about Blender. Um, I've been making, for years now, I've been making 3D models for 3D printing. Uh, a lot of them are, are commissions that people come like, hey, I want to make this thing. Uh, not so much recently because the tools have gotten good enough that people can just do them on their own. You know, they don't need someone to, to show them. They can just watch YouTube videos, learn Blender or SketchUp or any, you know, any of those free tools. Right. But uh, one one commission that I got years ago was to make a little orange surround for a pair of watches that are that go in the, the movie Aliens, like the you know the, the watch that the crew of the Nostromo wears. It's that you know old square watches. Like it's the future, so obviously everyone will wear two digital watches. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the luxury. <laughs> Uh, in the future, everyone will have two CRT televisions. Yeah. Oh, man. One for the bedroom and one for the bathroom. Right. Unless you're on a spaceship, and then you're just going to fill your spaceship with with CRTs. <laughs> Giant humming CRTs. Humming, EM-emitting, heat-generating, voltage-sucking, <laughs> heavy-ass <laughs> CRTs. Uh-huh. And you go through a, a nebula and you're going to have to degauss all of them. <laughs> Finally, the guy who put the degauss button on those things is like, has to feel like the most useless person in the world. Who ever hit the degauss button on purpose? We would do it for fun to mess with each other. And someone's playing right. a video game and they're right in the middle of a tense situation. You're like, ha, degauss. Right. Now you can't see what you're doing. <laughs> right <laughs> or you're like oh i need to move my monitor and you accidentally like when you reach back to grab onto it because you got to get a firm grip on something that heavy or you'll hurt yourself <laughs> you reach to the back and you're like donk oops hit the degauss button you made that lovely boom <laughs> sound oh it's great so anyway, th there's this watch from Aliens, and uh, the watch that they based it on was a real watch by Casio. It's the F100. Um, but they stopped making them years and years ago. Like, they don't make them anymore. And so they're this collector's item now worth hundreds of dollars. And uh, really? so people are asking okay. me, yeah, yeah. I have to... I. So what is the demand for... Are Do people... Was this watch unusually good, or do people just want it because they have... Is it nostalgia, or does it have some utility that you can't get today? Well, no one makes watches with buttons on the face anymore. They're always on buttons on the side. Um, and the right. F100 did have buttons on the face. I, I don't know if anyone wants that functionality, but it seems like all of the demand for it nowadays is driven by the fact that this watch was in the movie Aliens, and people want to make props that actually work oh, and tell time. Of course, yeah. So right. people have been asking me like, hey, uh, can you make me a prop that's got like F-100s in it? I'm like, no, they cost hundreds of dollars. Are you crazy? Right. Um, so, but I finally got to thinking, I'm like, man, there's got to be a way to do this. So I, I fiddled around with modeling. I bought a couple of cheap watches and uh, came up with a design that seems to actually work. I I ordered the, the parts and they got 3D printed, arrived, and I put them together and it actually... It actually works. I'm, I'm holding one right now. It's like, this is really cool. It's like got buttons you can press and stuff. And it doesn't look exactly like the one in the movie, but it looks pretty close. So, uh, so anyway, that's I, I put a video up. I, you can link it or uh, I'll link it in the, in the YouTube I'll video. Embed and, uh, yeah. I'll embed it. It's, it's pretty cool. And to me, it like I didn't remember the watch from the movie. I just never noticed that detail. But when you put on the double watch, I was immediately like, oh, that feels right. Oh, that feels so right. <laughs> like, I don't remember mm. it, but some part of my brain recognizes it, if you see what I mean. Right. It fits right. in with that weird uh, aesthetic of, of retro future 80s tech. 
again, CRTs yeah. in space. <laughs> yeah. So when I set it up, I set one to 24 hour time and one to 12 hour times so that I don't have to convert. It's, you know, it's the little things in life. Right. <laughs> Double watches. That's brilliant. It's a, re it's a really cool little, little gizmo you made. It does look cool. Thanks. It is the, fr I've never considered wearing a watch like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to diss anybody that's listening to the show. But I've never been impressed by somebody because they've got a really fancy watch, right? Like, oh, this is mm. so, so expensive, fancy time. Pe but I'm not disrespecting you. I'm just saying it doesn't do anything for me. But, the, you know, the looks of a watch have never impressed me. But this watch is one watch I would wear because of the way it looks. I mean, it's completely impractical who would wear a watch in a world where you have a cell phone. But... Um, yeah, I, I like the double watch look. <laughs> like if it was just watches all the way around, that would be too much and it wouldn't be fun anymore. <laughs> it's a the, bracelet, right? It would just be a dumb bracelet, but the double watch is just the right amount of eighties tech extrapolated a little bit into the future and then made ridiculous and i love it it's pretty fun i've been i've been kind of enjoying working over the years because people send me requests like hey can you make a watch surround for this watch and can you make a surround for this other watch um and so i've got a whole a whole bunch of them on my on my page there you can get them for you know various sizes and various configurations and things you can get the calculator watch from back to the future they still sell those, so you can get a watch surround, so you can wear two of those, so you can do two calculations at once. <laughs> oh, I, you know what? I want to do a vector math, so I'm going to wear three of them. Ooh. <gasps> no, I'm do get matrix Texas I'm instruments get... on your wrist. No, 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 no. I'm going to get nine of those watches, and I'm going to nine calculator watches, and I'll do matrix transforms. <laughs> I've got to make a watch surround for a TI-89. Can we talk about the fact that TI, Texas Instruments naming, product naming, is absolutely abominable? Oh, man. Yeah. Like, the engineers understandably just name things. with Because, you know, you're iterating. You're there in the lab just, like, building stuff and, you know, hand-wiring temporary circuit boards and plugging wires into breadboards just to get something working for testing. And so you give it, you know, just, you you iterate on the number. Oh, this is, you know, number 99. And then they walk out, yeah, uh, this is number 99, uh, four slash A. That's the, and then they're just like, great, we're going to box it and ship it as that. And I was like, aren't you <laughs> going to like have somebody name it as if it was a product to sell to people? Right. No, we're just going to name it the part number. The TI-99-4A is one of my favorite machines from the, the 80s. The, from the, the, the days before, it was all IBM versus Mac computers. Hmm. The, the two darlings for me were the Commodore 64 in the late 80s and in early 80s you had the ti-99 4a as just being this lovely friendly machine that they could do really cool stuff and it was called the ti like what was the calculator you just named the ti-89 right so a calculator is the ti-89 but then a personal computer is the TI-99 4A. So you can't even like tell what these things are. There's not like what was number 82? It was, it was probably, you know, a juicer. Like there's just no relation right. between these different right. part numbers. Yeah, they're just serializing whatever it was that got finished first. Right. This is just the number of things we've ever sold. This is our 99th project product. Was the TI-99 4B like a, a, an engine warmer no. or something? <laughs> yeah, there was no... That was the only one. It was 4 slash A. And I never saw 
any other products named like that. Hmm. Yeah, that's so funny. Y yeah, you'd think that they would have... Well, I guess Texas Instruments, like, it's right there in their name. They're not Texas Marketing. That's true. <laughs> it's true. And, you know, there is a certain comfort in that. Like, marketing will lie to you. An engineer will not lie to you. An engineer might be have difficulty communicating with you, but at least they're not trying to deceive. Right. Right. Yeah. They're they're like, look, this is this is what I got. Here's my data sheet. Right, exactly. You ask, oh, what does it do? And they just hand you the white paper that inspired them to build a product and the data sheet that's just the raw specs. And you're like, I you know, you're like, does it come in green? And you're like looking at this data sheet, like, I don't and he's like, well, technically, be, it being green isn't out of spec. It's like, that's right. Help It'll me. perform its duties no matter what color you paint it. As long as you don't paint <laughs> right. this part right here. Right. It's like, you are very unhelpful. Don't you have some marketing person that'll come out and lie to me? <laughs> Page five has all the masking zones. You mask these off before you paint it. Whatever color you want. Yeah. Ah. Oh. I learned... Uh, several different var variants of basic during the 80s and the ti 99 was always my favorite just because it could do the coolest stuff it would let you on the fly remap any character in the character set um what and you just yeah so like you would have to construct you could construct um sprites eight by eight images they're single pixels on off bits mm -hmm. and you construct them out of hex codes and i could do this in my head when i was 12 years old i just like you know think of a shape oh i want to make a heart okay i'd sit there and just type it out oh because it's just two bits of or two characters of hex right uh no no it's um wait it was eight tall and you need two hexes per so it's 16 long 16 hex characters long oh, okay and uh i could i could visualize that and type it out but but when you do that you're redefining the entire character so as soon as it executes the program all the letter a's everywhere in the pro everywhere every letter a it shows is now a heart <laughs> oh man it, it it didn't have like some dead space in the character map that you could play with. Um, well, there was technically everything above one twenty eight was dead space, but you didn't have any had any way to type those characters. So if I wanted oh, characters for in course. my game, it had to be a character I could type, but it could ha couldn't be a character <laughs> like I'd be sitting there like okay, I'm using the letters in the word health. You know, I've got my display in the game and it's like the word health and the word, you know, mana and the word money. Oh, no. Okay. The letter Z, I'm not using, I don't, I never need the letter Z. So I can use Z for like the skeletons. That'll be my skeleton bad guy. <laughs> it's like, <you're> like <laughs> tr trying to cannibalize bits of the alphabet for use in your game i loved it it was super charming you know and you'd only start in on letters after you used up like you know slashes and brackets and all that stuff oh but yeah, sooner, yeah but sooner or later you'd get down to oh i need one more sprite all right what letter of the alphabet can i steal <laughs> and then you'll forget and it'll be like well done hero you know you win the game and it's like filled with with bizarro characters and little sprites from the game you're like all right i can't do that oh fun would it would it like redefine them for the the ui as well like when you're programming and typing in keywords and stuff oh oh thank goodness um when you stopped the program and it returned you to the command line it would undo all of that shenanigans so you wouldn't oh, have to worry wow. about trying to program with all that done <laughs> Oh, that, that would have been an extra level of challenge. That's so cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, those were cool days. Just working within those limitations. It was really fun. Well, speaking of fun little games, 
uh, have you finally played Before We Leave? I did. Um, yeah, you played this. What? It's been like a month and a half since you played it, right? Yeah, I, I it played right up to the end game. I didn't quite beat it, but I it was in sight, and I was like, okay, I, I get it. Um, and I said, oh, that sounds great. I'm going to get it, and then I didn't until now. I have to say, I... I'm not enamored of the gameplay, but I am double enamored of its presentation. Um, first of all, hex grids and hex grids are always superior to square grids. In every way. Right. I mean, like the guy said, hexagons are the best of gons. <laughs> um, that's just, I love that, but I love, I didn't really get this looking at the game on in the trailers and stuff but like when you don't see part of the planet it just doesn't fill it in so y the planet is just an uh, it's like the, this is planet is all crust and there's no interior so when you really yeah. see so you're filling in this shell of a sphere that's made entirely of hexes and once you get about half the planet filled in you know your little boats are floating around and filling in just strips of hexes as they sail across the ocean you know it forms these weird tendrils and bridges and then i start one <laughs> and it feels like the whole thing would just be precarious but of course you know it's a solid sphere it's just you can't see it all and instead of hiding it behind um a fog which is what most games do just hide it behind blackness hmm. instead of doing that the game just doesn't show it and lets you see through the planet and it is just such a cool and the the interface is really great and then it lets you freely re rotate this ridiculous planet around and look at it from all different angles and it is just the most it's just delightful it's just delightful to interact with mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh, it's it's a very a very charmingly presented game I love how they've got all the well I, I talked about this in the previous episode but I love how they've got all the all the stats and stuff presented to you where you can just be like all right well what what do I need it like what am I running out of and it's just like well here's all the data like see for yourself it's kind of like the TI right just like well here's the data sheet right right you figure it out hmm it, uh, most games would give you just a number oh they they're they're unhappy I mean, I think it does have happiness, but it would be like, that's all you'd get. You know, city skylines, oh, everybody's unhappy. Well, why? I don't know. Interact with the simulation and maybe you'll figure it out. <laughs> so how far did you get? I got, um, all, I got to the second island and built that up and then was kind of like, a little lost the game was like hey you're done with the tutorial where you're ready to go on to another planet and i felt like well i don't know how to go to another planet <laughs> i mean i guess i can just keep doing more of what i'm doing but i'm not i'm not sure how to move towards my end goal i mean other than just researching more stuff did you and, turn off the tutorials or no it, it was like hey you're done you, you, yeah, you but they'll keep working. like the tutorials will keep running if you I don't know maybe they changed it for me the the tutorials like you can turn the tutorial off now if you want, um but you sh if you want to leave them on we'll just keep telling you what to do and I was like ah fine like you know keep telling me what to do it's fine by me right oh I got that message saying you or may maybe a miss maybe it's you know everything you need to know and you could turn it off now or whatever. I'm not sure yeah. what it was, but I, I felt like I'd reached some sort of point where I knew how to expand and build stuff, but I didn't feel like I knew what my long-term goal was. I mean, ultimately it was like build a rocket, but I didn't know the intermediate steps. And I was like, yeah, I'll take a look at this later. And, th and then I got into Blender and the rest of my week just, that was like Tuesday um oh yeah blender will do that to you and yeah and then the week just evaporated i was like what happened where'd my week go oh uh, yeah so once you get um once you get spaceships and you get a little it's it, a little past spaceships i think you, you start another colony somewhere or something or or maybe when you unlock spaceships there's some threshold where the space whales start showing up 
And that's kind of the driving, that's the ticking clock that, that really forces you to get on your game. Space whales. Yeah, they're, uh, they're something else. Spoilers for before we leave, I guess. That actually makes me want to go back and find out more about that. I associate whales, I mean, you, you make them sound dangerous. I associate whales with, a, you know, a resource that it's easy to hunt. <laughs> it's just irresistible mm. resource that it's easy to hunt it into extinction. Um, <laughs> right, right. In this case, it's, uh, if you don't mind spoilers. I do not mind. In this case, it's uh, giant whale-shaped space creatures that come by and, like, you know how baleen whales, like, scoop up a bunch of seawater and then, like, filter out all the stuff and, like, spit right. all the water back? They do that, basically, but with, like, the surface of planets. So they'll just, like, scoop up a whole bunch of the surface of your planet and, you know, and, like, spit out, you know, polluted landscape and stuff there. So it just, like, obliterates an entire section of your planet. Oh, that's... But they you leave better... behind baleenium, space whale baleenium or something. You can mine to get, like, for, for end game tech and stuff. Oh, please tell me you can kill them and get space blubber and use it to power your, your oil lamps. Yeah. <laughs> there, I, 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 like I said, I haven't quite beat the game yet, but the final, like, uh, thing you can build is a uh, space whale charmer. So I think the idea is that you... You befriend them somehow and then, I don't know, ride off into the interstellar space or something. Cool. I got kind of disillusioned when I was, I started building a, a thing and it's like, all right, now the whales are going to only attack this planet from now on. I was like, oh no. And then <laughs> like immediately after that, a space whale comes by and like eats half my island. I was like, I was not prepared for that. Oh no. All my population's gone and a bunch of the farms and stuff so i was just like uh i know what i have to do now but i don't want to anymore you gotta hunt them to extinction i hope yeah you can't you can't kill stuff even the at, when you get to some areas there's like these ancient ruins that you can get access to and but like when you when you open them up they awaken a minotaur that runs around it's like a it's like a mechanical monkey guy that runs around and like frightens everybody but no one dies like there's in in this game like nobody can get killed i guess um right. so like he just like frightens people and then to to defeat him you can't actually just like go out and kill him you have to like train a wrestler who like wrestles the minotaur but then <laughs> it doesn't defeat him permanently it just like tires the minotaur out so he's disabled for a while and then he comes hire, back you gotta get a wrestler to cut a promo to trash talk <laughs> the minotaur into agreeing to a cage match it's kind of like that um, and then the Minotaur keeps, like, getting stronger, and so you have to keep, like, getting a higher level trainer. I understand, like, the, why they did it, mechanically speaking, because the training, the, the wrestling training building takes more and more advanced kinds of foods, and so it incentivizes you to produce these foods, which also then produce happiness uh. in your population, so that it kind of pushes you toward more advanced stuff, because otherwise you could just sit there, right, with your potato fields, and you're like, I'm good, it's potato fields for everybody. <laughs> right, just but they. I did notice that. I also noticed that the scorpions. I went to the desert, and the scorpions are not dangerous, but it all they make people sad. People are sad yeah. when the scorpion is there, and I'm like, that's a, that's a really. What does a scorpion just go from town to town telling sad stories? Yeah, yeah, and psychic vampire scorpion just hanging out. Hey, uh, what you doing today? How how are you doing? How was your weekend? My weekend was okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a little weird that way where you're like, can't I take all these bunny rabbits from this island and like export them over here so that my guys are happy there too? It seems like it would be easy to transport. Right, right. But yeah, it is kind of a funny cardboard cutout, uh, kind of, you know, wooden, wooden meeple kind of game. Right? I, I actually really like that. I think there's a lot. The game gains a lot by removing a lot of detail. If mm. this was like a civilization thing where you could see your people walking around like as animated ambulatory with arms and legs, it would make you, it would feel different. 
it would make you expect a higher level of simulation. But when they're little wooden pegs that just like scoot around on their own, for one thing, that probably saved the designers from animating them. And for another thing, I think that actually conveys the level of simulation going on. Like, some games have super abstract mechanics, but then they'll present this, you know, high-fidelity world. And you end up with this surreal, again, like in Civilization, where I can see I have this fully animated 3D group of, you know, musketeers that have apparently been standing on the coast of this continent for 400 years. <laughs> right. Right. And they shoot at ships that pass by, but then they never actually sink any ships, but they keep at it. Yeah. Where are they getting their ammo? And like, what are they, what are they doing out there? Right. There's no cities nearby. What's going on guys? Right. And it's so funny. They like get down on one knee and bring up the rifle and you know, this little <laughs> animation of shooting at this galleon as it sails by. And you're like, the hell is wrong with these guys? They think they're going to sink a galleon by <laughs> shooting it with their blunderbuss? <laughs> like, how are you even hitting that? But if they were just like uh -huh. pegs, I wouldn't ask those kinds of questions. You know, that would convey the appropriate level of abstraction. If they were just right. like a little play if they were a board game piece. But instead, it shows what looks like an RTS character so i'm expecting them to behave like an rts character and then it's just all weird yeah yeah the graphic the graphical presentation it's great for marketing but then it also sets expectations that sometimes you can't meet right and never intended to meet like we, we never intend the game to simulate all this complex stuff and it's like well then why did you put in all these complex visuals mm, yeah so for before we leave, it uh, it felt like it was is hitting the right level of complexity where it, it's like well the mechanics right. aren't great but that's that's what is portraying so I'll give it a pass. Right, right. You see that? And you, it's not that I felt like I needed to give it a pass. It's just it didn't add, it didn't create expectations and then fail to meet them. Mm. You know, I see that little peg and I'm like, yep, okay, okay. I expect this to be fairly abstract. Well, speaking of setting expectations, uh, I was using DaVinci Resolve the other day. I know you use the software as well. And uh, it said, hey, it's time for an update. I was like, okay, cool. Download the update. And uh, it, sets, it sends me a zip file. And so I'm downloading the zip file. I was like, okay, you know, zip file, it's fine. You know, compress stuff so that it doesn't take as long to download. And so it takes, you know, maybe a minute to download. It's like two and a half gigs. And, uh, and so then I go into the zip file and I'm like, okay, well, I want to want to extract it you know like what's in the zip files some sort of folder the budget files or something like that no it's just an installer and uh I, have you updated have you updated davinci resolve recently do you know what the punchline here is have, i have not what is the punchline so i went into the folder it's just an installer and the installer is already compressed and i know that because the compression ratio in the zip file is one percent so so they took a compressed <laughs> zip uh, like an executable they compressed it and then they put it in a zip file and it's the only thing in the zip file so like why is it in there what are you what are you trying to do why are right. you compressing this thing and the i the irony is if they just sent you the exe you'd run it right and it's two gigabytes you you put two gigabytes on your machine and you'd run the installer and it would install it right but mm. because it's in a zip you must now take it out of the zip so now you have the zip which is two gigabytes in the exe which is two gigabytes so by using this compression they have doubled the amount of your hard drive space you need to eat to install <laughs> yes. it yes yeah and on I, top of I've... that like the compression takes time it it takes time to uncompress oh, this yeah. thing so it's an un, it's an instant not insignificant amount of decompression that's going on and by the time it's done decompressing and then running the executable which also needs to decompress because that's also compressed and then like decompressing all the files inside there it's taken more time than it took to download it would have been cheaper for them in terms of like the, the, my time spent for them to just not compress it and send me the uncompressed right. file right 
yeah, when you factor in everyone's time and the double the hard drive space that it takes for everybody and the time on their end, you know, it's another step to deployment is to pointlessly zip this thing up. And, and then on top of all it. that, I've got like version 28.2 or whatever, and they want me to upgrade to 28.3. The installers are the same size. Like, they can't be changing that much about it. Can't you just send me an right. incremental and like send me the upgrade? Right. I remember back in the day, they used to have upgrade packs where it's like, I already have this version, just download the upgrade and you can go to the next version. Right. That used to be the norm, you know, back when bandwidth was expensive. Uh, mm. I think the world used to do that. We, you know, be like, all right, you'd run the diff and it would like look at all the files the program's using. You know, like, okay, we, this, this file we don't need to send an update for because it isn't touched. This one, okay, you can reuse half of the file. It's just the back half of the <laughs> file that needs to be right. 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 And, you know, it, it would make the download a lot smaller, which back in dial-up days was really important. I mean, who yeah. has time to download a megabyte? My goodness. <laughs> right. Yeah, Kick exactly. that off and then go for lunch. Well, and, and what if your what if your like phone line gets reset or someone picks up the phone oh, like it's right? just down the, down the drain all the like all and five hours of your download are gone, and what happens to us like all our entire user base all one thousand people all try and download at once I mean who has that kind of capacity <laughs> a thousand people trying right. to download a megabyte at once. That would be yeah, a you have to open megabyte. the door to the server closet to get some more air in there. <laughs> right. It's like a thousand megabytes. Is there even a word for that? <laughs> <laughs> Someday we'll have the words to express how impossible it is. Yeah, they'll call it a bigabyte. <laughs> so I, I was not too impressed with DaVinci Resolve's method of upgrading software. Oh, you weren't impressed? By the way, it wasted your time and filled up your hard drive pointlessly for an increment for uh, an update that you can't even tell what it did. Right, right. It's like a subset of a sub version. Like, what are you, what are you guys even doing? Especially considering that Blender has a video editor built into it, and the entire install of Blender is like fifty megs. Right. I did use a uh, Blender's editor. I used it to make that video. Oh yeah. Um, I, it is it is a good workflow. At first, I didn't understand. They're like, oh, you'll you'll you render it out as images, and then you take the then you make a new project. You make an empty project, import all the images, and export that as a video. And I'm like. Well, that just sounds like making a video, but with extra steps. But then I realized um, one of the renders I did took a few hours. And I realized, oh, if this if I had a job that was going to take several days, I'd want to be able to do it individual images at a time so I could pick up where I left off and then put it all right. together at the very end. Or so send your file to sense. a render farm and they can render them all in parallel. You know, Each machine renders one frame, whatever. Oh, you can do that? Yep. Is it expensive? <laughs> it's not even that expensive. That's the crazy thing. They've got dedicated render farms that just render Blender files all day. And so you can just send them your Blend file. You pack, there's even a button. There's a button for that where you push the button and it takes all the textures and all your you know external files and stuff and wraps them all into your Blend file. So you can just send one file over and then it unpacks it on the other end, renders you know whatever, splits it all up into a bunch of different frames and sends you the frames back when it's done. Oh, I, it's spoiler, I have a much more, I decided to do something with those gears. Mm. And, but this render is like one frame takes like three minutes to render. <laughs> no, I realize that's not even a lot, but yeah. that's a huge step up for me where, you know, my last project, each frame was, you know, 10 seconds. So yeah. now when I go to preview, it's like, oh. This is taking forever. Oh, just the denoising is taking forever. And so, and I realized, oh, geez, this would take my computer friggin' ages. But if you can pay just a few bucks, 
and have a render farm do it. That's actually really cool. I might do it just for the experience of using a render farm, even though my video does not need that sort of, you know, I could definitely do this on my machine. I could probably yeah, yeah. even do it. I could probably even do it overnight. Just go to sleep when, and it ought to be done when I wake up in the morning, probably. Mm. But I just like the idea of using a render. Like that would be cool. Like I, I, I would, I would be willing to pay a few dollars just for the experience of using a render farm because that sounds so cool. Yeah, and then you could write an article about it. Right. All right. We got back to Blender again. How did this happen? Now we're both into Blender. This is dangerous. This is going to become uh, the this Blender. This is very cast. dangerous. Yeah. We better do some mailbags, but I think we're out of time. Right. Um. Let's do one. Let's do one. This. Okay. This person. Tim here has been waiting, I think, for three weeks. So let's let's give Tim a break, and we'll, we'll do his question. Dear Diecast, I was doing a Dark Souls 2 all-achievement run. Yikes. Congrats, Tim. But I decided to pause it to play some Dragon's Dogma. For whatever reason, playing Dark Souls always makes me want to play Dragon's Dogma, which is quite odd, since no other action game does that. Do you guys have a game or series like that which... When you play it, makes you want to play a specific other game? Fail, Tim. Thank you again, Tim. Every one of the modern remakes, uh, or not, the spiritual successors to Descent all want, all make me want to play the original Descent. None of them have that magic. Mm. So I, I realize that's got a sting. You know, it's 2018 and you release this game with like full 3D graphics and bloom lighting and ray tracing and high def textures and it makes somebody want to play a game from 1993 but that's how it goes right uh, oh yeah the new the new um deus ex games make me long for the original and the new deus ex games aren't bad but every every situation i run into you know it's like Oh, I could knock this guy out or I could hack the door. And I can't help but think, you know, in the original, I could knock this guy out or hack the door or, you know, remotely control a robot or have a conversation with somebody in the previous zone and they'll give me a key to just walk in the front door with proper clearance. Or I could, you know, climb through um, the vent, climb through the vent or I can, you know, there's like 20 ways to solve every problem, or I wouldn't even need to go in there because I could have a conversation and skip it. Like the new games by necessity are so much less open than the old ones. And the old ones were just this limitless. In the old one, I could have hacked open the door or I could have blown it up with lamb charges or I could have put lamb charges on the wall beside it and then I, I don't know did you ever play that game I I never did I watched my roommate play it in college but I, I never actually played it myself okay it has these landmine things that you can stick to walls and whatever um the thing is you you know or you can just throw them on the ground they act like a grenade you can stick them to a wall and the thing is it's a real 3d object it's about the size of a hockey puck sticking on the wall well it's the early 90s collision engines being what they are that means you can stand on it yeah. so you stick you stick a lamb to the wall and now it just becomes this post that you can stand on so you hop up onto it even though it's like i said the size of a hockey puck sticking out of the wall you're so it's somehow right. bearing the the weight of this adult male and you stick another one on and you know you make a little staircase for yourself that you hop from from one landmine to the next and go over the wall and you could often and the game you know it wasn't like you'd get up there and it would be like all sky textures and missing polygons this was not something the designer planned on but the game doesn't immediately fly apart and you fall out of the level and get a game over. It's just the game deals with it. Um, so it continues to work fine. 
We're in modern games. And, the, do something and like. the NPCs don't have like a trigger for their dialogue. It's just like when you walk into the room, they're like, I don't know how you got in here, but I need to talk to you about something. Right. Right. They they might incongruously not have a conversation about you climbing the wall with landmines or the fact that you put <laughs> landmines on their wall. They might be totally chill with it. And that's a little funny, but it was fine. It was fine. And it was worth it for all that freedom. So yeah, that's that's a modern game that may, and the modern game is good, but the old one was better. Mm. And they didn't have good graphics giving you expectations that they couldn't meet. <laughs> right. Yeah. So do you have any uh modern games that you play that just makes you wish it was an old game? I don't know. I I, I occasionally I'm playing with a certain system in a game that reminds me of a system that I enjoy, and like like the railroads in, um, in Satisfactory, when you're putting those railroads down. I always oh, want to be like, yeah. oh man, I wish I was playing Roller Coaster Tycoon right now, because I want to put a loop in this thing, or I want to put like a corkscrew on my <laughs> railway. <laughs> I've gotten, I've, oh, in Factorio, I've wanted to build bridges for, for my, um, railroads I, I want to be able mm. to cross the tracks either g go through a tunnel under them or have them go overhead just not walking across the tracks you know and getting hit by yeah. the train again those hazardous level crossings it's uh it defies probabilities how many times i've been hit by the train you know the train only comes along once every two minutes how can it be that it just happens to be when I cross the tracks that it shows up? This is obviously right. de designers have have engaged in some sort of shenanigans to make sure it's like that a Looney it Tunes always... thing where the right. Wiley Coyote looks down the railroad track and he can see for miles and there's nothing there. He looks down the other way, right. he can see for miles, there's nothing there. He's like, okay, yes. steps out on the way, wham! Immediately, train. Yes, that is exactly what it feels like. I mean, fair and square, it really does. It my joking aside it does not cheat it just runs the loop but it is amazing how often i got hit by the dang thing i mean you you figure if it comes along once every couple minutes you know that's once every 120 seconds but somehow you know one out of 10 crossings results in me dying i'm not sure how that works <laughs> out but that's the way it is yeah yeah i don't really have any particular games that make me in general want to play other particular games but uh i don't play that many games these days so i guess some of the civilization games make me make me nostalgic for civilization one and civilization two or um or like some of the exploration in games makes me nostalgic for playing world of warcraft when it first came out but i, I think that may just be nostalgia it might not actually be like if i had actually gone back and played those games i would be having a better time now that you mention it, modern Civ games make me wish for Alpha Centauri. But then I go and try and run mm -hmm. Alpha Centauri, and the interface, the interface is just ass. And it's, like, capped so that you can't, like, run it at higher than, you know, 1024 by 768 or 800 by 600 or whatever was the norm back then. So you're stuck yeah. at this postage stamp resolution with this terrible interface that doesn't use modern hotkeys or conventions. But then I play the new game and I, I miss all the things that the old game did. But then I go to the old game and I miss all the interface advancements that the new one has. And then I just go play Doom. Wait, Doom 2016 or the original? <laughs> Damn it, Paul! Give me your freaking day. Well, I play the original Doom, and I long for better graphics, but then I go to the new Doom, and I play that, and I long for the better gameplay. Uh, to be fair to the new I, Doom, it's got, it's got wicked dry humor. Yeah. But then I just get frustrated trying to decide between those two, so I fire up Blender. Now we really are going to be here all day. All right. Thank you to everybody who sent in questions. There are... Four questions left here, but I'm sorry Paul talked too much again this week and didn't leave time for more mailbags. I blame his obs Blender obsessions. Uh, I'm sorry. To be fair, you did bring up Blender first, so I'm, my hands are tied. <laughs> yeah, I brought it up and I'm the one that did all the talking, but <laughs> I'm blaming you anyway. Um, Yeah, so hopefully we will get to these next week.
Thank you to everybody who's sending questions. If you have a question for the show and you're optimistic enough to think we'll eventually answer it, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. So I really was considering adding another blender related topic to this whole thing, but uh, I'm glad I didn't. This is well, we'll save it for later. Uh, well, if you want to send it into the show, our email is diecast at Oh, there you go.